want to know is there anybody in here who can definitively say with evidence by looking at your behavior, not your clothes, that you are not who you are? I mean, how many changes took place in one year? No matter what we want to think, no matter what we want to believe, we all changed in 2020. My life changed, my mind changed, my habits changed, my discipline changed. I am not who I was. And some of you, you're even watching this right now, and you know, in just less than 10 months, your whole life looks completely different. And you weren't expecting that, you weren't planning on that, you had no idea those changes were coming. I suppose the question is, did you change for the worse? Or did you change for the better? Because everyone changes, but not everyone improves. Successful people know how to change with the times. They don't get stuck in a rut, doing the same thing, the same way, year after year. They're constantly evaluating where they are. And they make adjustments so they can improve. We have to stay open for change. We can't get so set in our ways that we won't try anything new. This is why many people don't have any enthusiasm. There's no freshness in their life. Every time an opportunity comes for change, for promotion, because they're not used to it, they shrink back. They don't realize that's what's keeping them from going to the next level. I had a change in my heart. I had a change in my mind. I had a change in my behavior. When he, when he got no change in me, I thought completely differently than I do today. You can see it in my walk. You can see it in my talk. You can see it in my behavior. People I used to run with, I don't run with anymore. Places I used to go, I don't go no more. I know I've been changed. I know I've been... But how many of you know that when you get tired, when you get fatigued, when you get desperate, you start lowering your standards pretty quick? Like, you ever woken up in the night mad thirsty? Did you make your way to the refrigerator? You open up that refrigerator, the light hits you like it's heaven. Because if you get thirsty enough, you'll drink anything. Some of us have been on the faith journey for a while, and we have gotten tired on our journey. Yet when you start to get tired, it's a bad moment to make big decisions because you will lower your standards. Some of us in this room, we have settled for second best because we traded an eternal blessing for short-term gratification. Napoleon said, number one, a leader needs unwavering courage. I don't know if I totally agree with the unwavering part of this or not, because sometimes our courage does waver a little. It bend but not break. You know, courage mounts up, and then sometimes we have the doubts that creep in, and we reach a little deeper to find that courage that overcomes our doubts and our fears. So I would probably debate a little bit with Napoleon on this unwavering courage because sometimes courage does waver but as long as it stays as long as that in the end there it is to serve you the courage to do what you didn't think you could do the courage to step into territory that might be a little unfamiliar the courage to talk to somebody you don't know the courage to attempt conducting a meeting the courage to give your first testimonial the courage to solve problems you couldn't solve before, that kind of courage. Courage to stand up when it's sort of dark in your corner, the courage to do it when it isn't going your way seemingly, that kind of courage. Wavering a little at times, yes, because we all have doubts that attack us, we all have small fears that creep in, that is the nature of life. But that's what faith is all about, that's what courage is all about, to serve us when our doubts will not serve us well. Faith to overcome fear and courage to overcome our doubts. Second, Napoleon said, self-control. That, of course, is the very essence of life itself, is self-control. Because we all have this warfare going on. You know, it's going on in the world, the warfare between liberty and tyranny. Uh, in our own body, the warfare between health and illness, the struggle is on. Struggle between light and darkness, the struggle between good and evil, 
I call it opposites in conflict. And as soon as you're born into the world, as soon as you find yourself and discover yourself on this spinning planet headed somewhere, you know that this exists. To be a civilized society, we must drive the dark side of our nature into a small corner and let the positive side flourish. In the coming days, don't be surprised if God brings new opportunities across your path. Some of you are going to be offered a position that you feel is over your head. Or maybe you single people. God's going to bring somebody new into your life. You'll be tempted at first to play it safe. Think about all the reasons why you can't do it. You've been hurt in the past. You can't get into that new relationship. You're not qualified for that new position. But if you're going to experience God's best, you've got to be willing to take a risk. You can't get stuck thinking that it can only happen one way. This life that you're living is one long, big journey. And maybe you hit an obstacle on the way that slowed you down, or maybe you put your goal on the back burner, but do not call yourself a quitter. You're already telling yourself that you're a quitter. You put that in your background, and I don't want to see that happen to you because you matter too much. You are not a quitter. You are not someone who gave up. You are simply someone who may have not been ready to face some of the demons that are in your background who may have not been ready enough to say, you know what, I love myself enough this time, this time to believe myself enough to keep showing up for myself. What would you do with your life if you had it to live over? What is one value, one deep commitment from which you would never bulge? Are you proud of how you have been living your life? Have you explored your natural talents, your gifts, by enthusiastically trying a variety of activities? Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of us have so much talent and abilities, we just put them back on the back burner, just left them aside someplace. Never did anything with them, never brought them out here. What are you sitting on? What gifts are you sitting on? Have you resigned yourself to a life feeling that nothing can be done to change your future or your circumstances? Have you been afraid to try something different because you're afraid of how people will react to you or what they will think? Early, we must learn to exercise self-control. Power is a wonderful thing, but it must be exercised properly. It must be exercised to benefit, not to destruction. So self-control is certainly necessary uh, to be a strong leader so that you can become the best example, the example of having your temper well-managed to having that dark side of your nature under control. The best example of choosing wise words and not being careless, that kind of control. Control of your appetite, control of your desires so that they fit into the positive side of life and not the negative side. Then he said, a leader must have a keen sense of justice. How very true. Justice we become familiar with, you know, even when we're small when certain things that happened or were done to us that we, something told us that wasn't right. Someone did us wrong. We have that sense of right and wrong and it starts very early. Then we have to have that sense of utilizing what's right and what's wrong so that we develop this sense of justice, this sense of being fair, this sense of being on the positive side, on the right side, to minimize a person's mistakes they need to have this sense of justice. We have to have justice when we're building an organization. You know, what's fair? What is a good balance? Certain rules and regulations so that all of us have a chance to fit within this framework of fairness, justice, and what's right. Otherwise, enterprise cannot work. Otherwise, we have what we call in the political sense, anarchy, where there is no justice when might is the order of the day, power is the order of the day, not the law, not the rule, not what's right, but power. And we would all dismiss that. It's been a catastrophe in the last 6,000 years, the governments that resorted to power instead of democracy, that resorted to intimidation instead of freedom. And we all know the terrible toll that that takes. But it takes a toll not only politically in a country or politically around the world, but it takes a toll even in enterprise. It takes a toll in school if a teacher is unfair. It takes a toll in 
working on a team where someone is unfair or where the leadership is not fair in the administration of justice. So this is true, a keen sense of justice and what's fair and what's right. Part of this we have to learn as we go. You know, you don't have it all the first year. You haven't got it all the second year, the third year. After all the years that I've been around, both as a human being and as a business person, you're still, even at these years, trying to decide what's best, what's fair, what's right, to give balance to our life and to build on a firm foundation for the future. Here's another one he said, definiteness of decision. Indecision is the thief of opportunity. If you don't decide, the opportunity could slip away. If you don't decide what you're going to do today, the day could get away and you're not very effective. To the best of your ability, have some idea, some good plan, sure enough, the day escapes. And in the morning you say, let's see, what should I do now? In the afternoon you say, hey, time's getting away from me, what should I do now? And now most of the day is lost. When I know I need to change something, what I do is I change it. I've had people that listen to the podcast and they've reached out to me over the past few years and one of the main messages that they took and put into action was actually putting things into action. These are just normal people, but they're normal people that knew they needed to make a change and they decided they were going to make a change and then they made it. And that is what you can do too. If you have something to change, if you want to change something, change it. Change it now. Find something that you can look at your life that you say, hey, I know I've got a problem in this area, being late, I need to take care of that. Procrastinating, I need to deal with that. Creating an imbalance in my life where I'm spending more time looking at television or having social fun and not spending enough time working on me. See, most people spend more time working on their jobs than they spend working on themselves. And whatever we achieve in life, whatever we create, whatever we're able to manifest comes out of the human mind. So many times, guys, we get distracted by things that we either have no control of or matter nothing to our goals. I want to ask you guys tonight, just do a little favor. And I want you to write down things that you focused on today that held you back from being the person that you want to be. Did you worry about the behavior of someone else, something that you got no control over? Or did you stress about something that hasn't even happened yet? Did you give yourself negative vibes because you're worried about something that you have a fear over? And then I also want you to write down things that you focused on today that helped get you closer to the person that you want to be. Did you eat right? Did you exercise today? What are things that you focused on today that you know are going to make you a better version of yourself so that you can show up stronger tomorrow than you did today? You've been given the dignity of choice. You don't have to repeat this year the same as last year. You can tear up last year's plan, develop a new plan. Now here's the choice on being a human being, to be part of all we were meant to be, or to be all, to strive for all, or half, or some. The choice is up to you, to develop one skill or ten skills. And this is all a matter of choice, and when someone says, no, you ought to learn four, you've got to resist all that, because this is personal dignity. And you don't want to destroy someone's dignity by doing all the odds, and they feel reluctant to do it, now we've got problems. Most of the day escapes not being utilized. It doesn't work for you simply because you didn't make those decisions early at the early part of the day. The decisions we make in the early part of our life sometimes last for a lifetime. The early decisions that you make about what you're gonna do with your life, those decisions are vitally important. If you neglect them and don't make them, sure enough, the time passes and the opportunity sometimes is diminished. And sometimes you spend a lot of time now catching up simply because you didn't make those early decisions. So it's the decisions at the first of the day, it's the decisions at the early part of the month, it's the decisions at the early part of the year that greatly determines what kind of year you're going to have. The decisions you make in the early days of your marriage, sometimes those are the decisions that affect the marriage for a lifetime. The decisions you make at the first chance you see opportunity, 
those decisions, what you're going to do with it, how far you're going to take it, what it's going to be meaning to you in the years to come. Those early decisions are vitally important. Then we need decisions to correct poor decisions, to overcome our mistakes. It's possible, of course, for all of us to make unwise decisions. And at the end of one year, at the end of one week, one month, or at the end of a few years, we say, that decision cost me too much, cost me a lot of time, cost me a lot of money, uh, cost me maybe a good relationship, uh, cost me a chance to be productive. But as long as you're alive, there's still a chance to use new decision power to correct the mistakes of decisions that were bad in the past. All of us have the opportunity to do that, but I think Napoleon was right here too. You got to be definite in making decisions so that the opportunity doesn't pass you by. Take advantage. Here's the next one. Napoleon Hill said, a good leader has definite plans. How important that is. So here's what you should do. The lack of plans have lost a month or two, or you've lost a week or two, or maybe you've lost a year and you were 10% effective instead of 100%. Now's the time to change all that and start making some plans. You got to have some plans for your family, right? You got to take your family along. Don't leave them out. One of the challenges all of us have in making our plans is how to balance everything to make sure that we don't regret at the end of the year. I spent too much time on that. I spent too much money. And then if you have say, how can I not do that again? Construct some better plans uh, so that you won't have any regrets at the end of a year to come, five years to come, three or four, five years to come. But now for you, your plans, your plans to be financially secure. You got to have a good plan for your resources so that you find yourself secure regardless of what happens. One more on plans, and that is the plan for your personal development. The plan to be better this year than last year. The plan to take the classes, attend the, the workshops, do everything you possibly can to show personal progress, not just financial progress, not just the progress of having one more car or one more home, but the progress of personality, the progress of communication skills, the progress in how to deal with people, progress in using your influence so that it multiplies its power by five by 10 versus what it used to be. You need those kind of plans, a plan for personal growth, personal development. Next, Napoleon Hill had a good saying. It was something my father had and passed it on to me as a good philosophy. And here's what he said. A good leader has the habit of doing more than what he gets paid for. What an incredible philosophy this is. The habit of doing more than you get paid for. It's what we call the service that you put out like seeds in the ground that doesn't bring the harvest immediately, but the harvest is yet to come. It's called like putting out the capital in capitalism. Doing more than you get paid for means that you're getting ready for the next move up. Because if you do more than you get paid for, you've made an investment. The average person might think if I do more than the company requires, uh, you know, then they're ripping me off. You know, I'm not getting paid for that extra time, that extra attention. But you must not view it that way. You must say I'm getting there a little earlier, staying a little later as an investment in my own personal future because I want that kind of reputation. I want that kind of philosophy to work in my life. Do more than you get paid for, right? They've got the product, you've got the money, but you can't stop your investment there. Now you must develop the investment in time, effort and energy in turning that new customer into a testimony. And sometimes that's the most difficult work, the work after the sale, because the sale might be fairly easy. Someone says, hey, I've been looking for this product. I need it, here's my money. But now you've got to stay with them, make sure they don't just buy the product, but that they use the product. And that they don't just use the product, they keep using the product. That's the work after the sale. But if you learn to make that kind of an investment and do more than you get immediately paid for, that kind of investment is so powerful. So you do more than you get paid for up front. It's happened for me, making the investment. When I first started lecturing, I talked to high school classes, college classes, uh, service clubs, and I gave it all away. I went and talked for free. Someone said, Mr. Ohm, would you come and do this breakfast talk? I said, sure. Uh, could you do this luncheon talk for this service club? I said, of course. 
And all of that in the beginning was for free, primarily because I'd made my fortune. You know, I didn't need the money, but I did it for free. But look what it's made for me by giving that kind of service in those early days. And finally, it led to business and led to an enterprise. And I was giving a seminar all those years ago here in Los Angeles, and Mark Hughes was in my audience. So what you don't get paid for, don't worry about that. Just render the service with the vision of the future that it'll come back multiplied if you have this kind of habit, this kind of philosophy. Next, Napoleon Hill talks about personality. You need a pleasing personality. There's many parts to your personality. One is your working personality. You know, the kind of behavior, the kind of attitude that you need, especially in the public. Some things you can kind of get by with being a little careless, maybe in private, but in public where it counts so much in your paycheck, it counts so much in building your business for the future, your own personality. But here's what you also must remember. You develop your personality in private so that it serves you well in the public. Sometimes we get the mistaken idea, I can be careless with just these few and be more careful when I have a thousand. But see, that doesn't work that way. Careless with a few, sure enough, that will creep into your presentation for a thousand people. You say, well, I'm only talking to two people. It doesn't matter much. That's when it really matters. Because if you'll practice well there, using your personality, using your influence to get someone's attention, to get them to listen, to get them to participate, the kind of personality that someone says, I'd like to be around this person. Uh, they're unusual. They're not like the average person I meet on my everyday experience, that kind of personality. But you've got to practice it behind the scenes. You've got to practice it one-on-one. -on -one. And if you're effective one-on-one, one-on-three, -on -one, one one-on-five, I promise you that will get you ready to now perform with the kind of personality, the kind of charisma that wins people when you're in front of 500 people, 1,000 people, 5,000. So this is a good point, working on your personality. Here's the best gift you can give someone, and that's the gift of attention. Attention is so powerful. So, same thing you can learn to do. Utilize your personality, utilize your influence, give people the gift of attention. Next, Napoleon Hill said a leader needs sympathy and understanding. We have to develop that early in our lives. All of our lives, we have to look at those that are less fortunate than we are those who need a helping hand. And especially now we learn to look at those who need an opportunity, those who need a change in their health, those who need a change in their life and in their lifestyle. It's this kind of sympathy and understanding that drove Mark Hughes to construct the company. It took that kind of understanding, that kind of sympathy, that kind of deep emotional feeling. Then Mark understood what it meant to be poor. He understood what it meant not to have. He understood what it meant to be short on finances, on resources. He understood what it meant to lack full formal education. He knew all of those lacks. And instead of crying about it, he said, what I will do is change it for myself. And then I'll help other people that have the same challenge. Lack of education, lack of the money, lack of the resources, lack of good health, faced with all kinds of difficulties they can't solve. I'll get mine solved and then I'll be strong enough and have the skills to where I can help other people. That kind of leadership quality is so powerful. That kind of understanding. Here's the next one. A leader must have, Napoleon said, a mastery of the details. How very true. All can be lost with just a couple of missing details. The drama is in the details. Someone says, you know, I lost 30 pounds. Well, 30 pounds is 30 pounds, but that's not the drama. The drama is where were you before now someone begins to give us some of the details. And then after they've lost the weight, now how they feel, now their self-confidence has been restored. Now they feel better about themselves. The drama is in the details. But this is also important in the details of your day, the details of your business, uh, the details of good communication. Master the details. Now here's the next three. Willingness to assume full responsibility. Mark Hughes says, what happened to me might not have been my responsibility, but what I do about it is my full responsibility. I've had some things, some people did me wrong. In his first couple of business experiences, he was done wrong. Some people ran off with the money, he was left holding the bag. But he said, that's what happened. 
and I was not responsible for what happened, but I am responsible for saying to myself, now what am I gonna do about what's happened? If a hailstorm destroys the farmer's crop, he wasn't responsible for that. But his responsibility now begins when the hailstorm is over, when he asks the question of himself, what should I do now? Now that this catastrophe is over, now that the damage is done, now what should I do about it? And a philosophy I've taught all these years, it's not what happens to you that determines your future. It's what you do about what happens that determines your future. And this is a major part of it, accepting full responsibility. If you've got an organization, you're conducting meetings, and you're the leader, the responsibility ends with you. Someone else may mess up, make some mistakes, still your responsibility. Some things over which you have no control, understandable. But what you do about it now, how you fix it, the diplomacy you use, the strategy you use, that's the kind of responsibility now that depends on you. Also, you've got to be responsible for your future. Nobody's gonna fix it. No one else is gonna design it. No one else is gonna come along and say, hey, I will make sure it all works well for you. You've got to take all the input, You've got to take all the testimonials, all the teaching, all the training, all the influence, then you've got to have the responsibility of designing your life. You can design a life of prosperity, or you can design a life just to coast and get by. The responsibility belongs to you. Next is cooperation. Ideas, we take advantage of each other's input. We take advantage of each other's enthusiasm. We take advantage of each other's testimonial, and we take advantage of each other's willingness to grow. In those early days, Mark got the group together, Jerry Shatanovich, Doug Stunts, the rest, and made some plans to cooperate. He said, no telling what kind of powerful meetings we can have if we work together. No telling how many people we can affect, even right away, if we work together. You do this part, you do this part, I'll do this part, we'll make it work together, and we'll get the ball rolling. There's an ancient phrase that says, if two or three agree, nothing is impossible. If they agree on the same project, if they agree on the same vision, if they agree on how to get there, I'm telling you, nothing is impossible. Nothing can stand in their way. Just two or three. If we cooperate, there's nothing we can't do. There isn't anyone we can't touch with this incredible story. Cooperation. That's why I'm here. Send out some ideas. Give you some notes to take. Something to think about and ponder. Something to talk about with the people that you associate with and are building your business. That kind of cooperation is going to make this a powerful year. But it'll get us to much more than just those numbers. It'll get us to a place of honor, respect, prestige, influence, feeling good about ourselves for the hard work that we're doing, cooperating with each other. Now here's the last one. Napoleon Hill said, a major attribute of leadership is vision. Vision is in many parts. One, a vision for your own course to follow. A vision for you for yourself, a vision for your financial future, a vision for your health, a vision for your wealth, a vision for you to latch onto and make something out of, a vision for your family, because vision must now lift others as well as ourselves. Guess what our family is counting on? That we'll be able to see things that at first they cannot see. That we'll be able to look further into the future than perhaps they will be able to look. The same is true with your organization, the people that are around you. They're counting on your vision. Perhaps you've been there a little longer than they have. Maybe you've been there a lot longer than they have. And they will look to you to help them see things that they can't see in the beginning. And if you will do that, develop that attribute of leadership, I'm telling you, you'll have such a dramatic effect on your organization, it will be unbelievable. A vision for yourself, a vision for your family, a vision for your organization, a vision for the people that you're close to. Nobody's gonna come knocking at your door with opportunities. You gotta create them. Out of sight, out of mind. We talked about this before. Out of sight, out of mind. No one will ever have you in mind for anything unless you have yourself in mind for it. Get on people's radars. That's it. Got to interact, socialize, get around the right people. Out of sight, out of mind, people. I can't tell y'all enough. What is the plan? Any man with no plan shall perish. What is the idea? What is the vision? What is it? What's happening? What's going on in your mind that the world needs to experience?
Listen to what I'm saying, people. You are the future. I do not want you to start thinking as small as your bank account. Be obedient to the visions, the ideas. Move on them. Out of sight, out of mind. It's grind season. It's hustle season. I need to awaken the beast inside of you. If you make it to the end of this video again, I want you to write, the world is an empty canvas waiting on new thoughts to think. And it's on us to create those thoughts. It is your responsibility to be obedient to God's visions. How dare you have God to send you a vision and a thought and an idea or show up and reveal these things and ideas to you in your dream. It, it can be you writing a book. It can be you with all of your arts and crafts and designs. It can be you with sports. What are your visions and ideas that God has sent you? What is it? What's taking you so long to move on it? Put your money together. Budget your money. Make the move. Make the move. Just do it. And guess what? If you hit a wall, get your ass back up and keep going. I've made it this far from hearing way more no's than I've heard yeses. But I'm not afraid of the word no. Write the vision and make it plain so that he who reads it will run to it. And even though it tarry, that means take a long time, wait for it, for surely it will come at an appointed time. Listen to me. That's real. If you don't think it's real, I dare you to try it. Write everything you want on a piece of paper. Everything. Use your wildest imagination. If you can think it, you can achieve it. Write it on a piece of paper. Read it every morning and every night. Come back here one year from today and see how much of that stuff that came true. You have to write it. If it's not written, you reduce your chances greatly of it ever occurring. One underneath the other. Just let your dreams run free here. Not what you think you can get, but what you want. If everything fell into place and you could have whatever you wanted the next 10 years, what would that be? Little things, major things, insignificant things, doesn't matter. Just make the list. I got to tell y'all something. The real reality is this. When you decide what you want to do for your life and your career, when God sends you a vision, a bold vision and confirmation around that book you were supposed to write, anything, it's going to be your family and friends and loved ones to be the first ones to try and talk you out of greatness. Because why? They were never sent that vision. They were never sent that idea. They were never sent that concept. As a matter of fact, if you try and explain it, they're still not going to get it. Because you see the invisible. You see what's not there. Only those that can see the invisible can do the impossible. You have to be able to see what's not there in order to pull off the impossible. Be clear in your mind in what you intend to achieve. Know what you are going to do. That doesn't seem like too much to ask. But how often do we see people going through their lives without knowing what they are trying to do without having any intent, without having a clear mission. I'm talking on an individual level. As a person, people go through their lives without knowing what it is they want to do, what they want to accomplish. Know what your mission is. Know what your intent as the commander of your life. Know what your intent is and then fight with everything you've got to win. Three major parts of personal development. Number one is physical part. Part of success is physical. Some people don't do well because they don't feel well. One of the first things to go to work on with intensive effort, and that's your own good health, because a lot of things come from that. You know, the future possibilities could be greatly, 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 greatly diminished by being lazy in producing maximum health. If you'll take care of that as a support system, 
You can't believe what else is possible. You can't believe what the mind can think of. You can't believe your imagination and your faith and your ability to say, hey, I'll go to work and produce the muscle to do the deal. Why? I'm healthy. I'm vigorous. I'm vital. I'm not out of breath. But sometimes, you know, when all these ideas and stuff comes and, you know, you're too, a little bit too weak to even attempt, you say, oh, I'm not sure I can do that. The doubts sometimes are more physical than they are mental. You haven't got the vitality to believe it's possible. But if you've got the vitality and the strength and you've got the health to do it, I'm telling you, ideas seem to love to be invested in healthy people that have got the ability and the ambition to pull it off. They got the health to do it. They got the strength to do it. So why not start with the health and see if your own vitality would inspire you to more imagination? Because now when you imagine, you can pull it off. But if you can't pull it off, you know, why imagine? The imagination says, why to go to work and spin all of these goals and stuff when the body isn't ready to produce? So start with physical, it's very important. Now here's some good ideas. There's scripture that says this, treat your body like a temple. Excellent phrase. A temple meaning something you take extremely good care of. Treat your body like a temple, not a woodshed. Here's why, the body and the mind work together. The body and the physical and the health is a support system for the mental that can dream, that can think, that can ponder, that can wonder, that can design, that can believe, that can have the spirit and all that's possible in terms of emotional content. But now, since the mind and the body work together, you got to take care of the body as a support system. One wise man said, sometimes the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. See, that's a sad combination, a willing spirit and a weak body sad you wake up in the morning right the mind says let's go get him the body says i can't even get out of bed so have a talk with yourself and say this is the last time i'm going to be out of breath this is the last time i will lack the vitality to pull off my dreams because sure the dream factory will shut down if you haven't got the vitality and the energy and the health to pull it off so start taking care now here's the key to be conscious of self, but not self-conscious. You just got to take care of it. You don't have to be a fanatic. It doesn't take eight hours a day pushing weights to have relative good health. Just do the simple stuff, the exercise and the nutrition and the health and this, just do the stuff, you know, for normal pulling off with vitality, the dreams that you want, just a simple little plan will do. Now also part of the physical is the outside as well as the inside. Interesting phrase written, it says, God looks on the inside, people look on the outside. So you got to take care of both, the inside for God and the outside for people. What's the old phrase? You never have a second chance to make a first impression. So the outside appearance is also valuable as well as the inside vigor and vitality. Somebody says, well, people shouldn't judge you by your appearance. Let me give you a clue. They do, you can't bypass that. Now, of course, when people get to know you, They'll judge you by more than just how you appear. But physical, outside, inside. Here's what's good advice. Make sure the outside is an excellent reflection of the inside. Take care of both. So first in personal development on these three parts is physical. Here's the second, spiritual. I am a believer that humans are a special creation. I don't ask other people to adopt my belief, but I, I simply am a believer that humans are, are unique among all life forms. We're affected by how we feel, attitude. This is the emotional part. We need the intellectual part to set sail. So as the winds blow, we can still get where we want to go. Redefine, keep strengthening our psychological and philosophical guidance system. But now we're also affected by the emotions. That's the power. Four things to consider on attitude and how you feel. Here's number one. It's how you feel about the past. Past experience, even past losses, past failures, as well as successes. To review it and go back over it, see where you went wrong, correct that, invest that now in the future. Don't live in the past and don't carry the past around like a burden but simply use your past as one of your mentors to help refine mistakes, make some changes that you can invest now in the future. Here's the second attitude. It's how you feel about the future. 
We look back for experience. But number two, we look forward for inspiration. Take some time and decide what you want. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do the next 10 years, 20 years? How about the people you want to meet, the cities you want to visit, experiences you'd like to have over this next period of time? Here's the next key. Write it all down. Building a life is like building a house. You wouldn't start building the house until you had it finished. So I'm asking you not to be casual anymore. Start designing the future for yourself, for your family, for your business. Okay, decide what you want. So from the past we get experience, from the future we get excitement. Now here's the next advice. Put everything on your list of goals. Little things, insignificant to someone else, but important to you. So set goals. Set the goals that'll turn you on, goals that'll get you excited. Put everything on your list. Now, here's the next attitude. It's very important how you feel about everybody. If you want to be a leader extraordinaire, here's what you learn. Each of us need all of us. One person doesn't make an economy. One person doesn't make a symphony orchestra. Each of us need all of us and all of us need each of us. Each gift is important as we bring it to the table, as we bring it to the community. Now here's the last one on attitude. It's how you feel about yourself. Nothing more powerful than self-confidence to start multiplying your income by two, by three, by five, by 10. It comes from self-esteem, doing the things you know you should do. And at the end of this day, your self-esteem is soaring and high. Three key words, remember these words? Here they are, study, practice, and teach. If you are a believer in whatever religion or whatever spiritual part of your program. These are three excellent words, study, practice, teach. Don't neglect your studies on your own spirituality, whatever its origin, whatever your beliefs. Then practice, put it into practice so that number one, you become a good role model, first for your children. Then teach, pass it on. You gotta pass it on to the next generation and the next generation. What if the next generation gets a little weaker and the next generation gets a little weaker? Now the family foundation is starting to be weakened, which now weakens the nation because the nation is built up of strong family foundations. Now here's the third part. First is physical, second is spiritual, third is mental. Some key phrases on the mental part. First, the mind must be nourished. Food for thought, bread for the head. Yes, you need a slice of toast in the morning, right, for your body, but you need a slice of cassette you put in the car system and listen and listen, let something feed your mind. Here's what I teach in one of the other seminars on the mind, and that is stand guard at the door of your mind. Don't just listen to anything and everything. Make sure that you're, you're your own best filter of what goes into your mental factory and spins out the fabric of your life in the future. Stand guard at the door of your mind. Spend time, be a selective listener. But you gotta have a good diet, a good mental diet. When you walk into a home and walk into the pantry of the kitchen, you take a look what's in there. This, this family's either gonna be healthy or it isn't gonna be healthy. A lot depends on what's in the cupboard. What you bring home, right, from the grocery store that you feast on for the body. Now here's what's important. A proper menu for the mind to make sure that it's got a wide range of nourishment. Because the mind needs the full education the education of the dangers of life as well as the possibilities of life. Life consists of really two major things. One is avoiding the dangers and taking advantage of the opportunities. That's what life is all about. Avoiding the dangers and taking advantage of the opportunities. Now by education, you've got to be able to see both where somebody points out to you, these are the dangers, these are the possibilities. And if you keep refining your ability to see the dangers, to avoid as many as possible, and to see as many opportunities as possible and to maximize those as you go and refine and go produce and refine. Now that starts to develop the foundation for what we call a good life, a productive life, a fulfilled life. And we need this mental input so that you'll have mental food to feast on long after the lights are out and we've left the premises. Now, we also need mental exercise. We talked about debate earlier. That's good mental exercise, is it or isn't it? Here's what's important, to debate with yourself, to look at both sides of the issue. You must be a student of tragedy as well as triumph. You must be a student of ill as well as good. Ideas, learning to debate with yourself, what's good, what's bad, what's good for you, what isn't good for you. Keep your mind vigorous. Study evil as well as good. 
You need a good library. And in this library, you need all kinds of diversity. You need a book on Gandhi and you need a book on Hitler. Gandhi to show you how high and lofty someone's ambitions that are noble can go, and the other one to show you how despicable and low someone can sink in terms of pure evil embodied in a human. Don't be afraid of the debate. Don't be afraid of the health debate. Don't be afraid of the religious debate, the spiritual debate. Don't be afraid for something you believe in to be challenged. Because that's where the vigor and the and the flourishing of something is. It that is survives the debate. If it survives the debate, it's a pretty good idea. Okay. Mental exercises. So feed the mind, debate, exercise, a continual diet. You can't go too long in between the classes and the schools and the seminars and the sermons where things are being taught of value. Here's what else is important. You got to go to everything, everything you can afford. Have a good plan, weekly plan, monthly plan to go to a variety of things. Go to a variety of things. Go to a variety of things. And don't miss. Don't miss the chance. Even if you're involved in a certain company and they say we're going to have a training class, you say I've been to one of those. I'm asking you got to go again and you got to go again. You can't get it all the first time. When they call a little training class, make sure you're there. Here's why. Some of them are going to be life-changing. And you don't know which experience is going to be life-changing. You can't pick the one. You just got to go, 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 go. One is life-changing. You go again, you go again, you go again. Another one is life-changing. For the people that were there, somebody that you met, something that you heard, and that one was just perfect. The atmosphere was right, the crowd was right, and everything was right. And you'll never be the same again. And you don't know which one that's going to be. That's why you've got to pursue. Go often. Have a good plan for the search of knowledge and ideas that can inspire to the best of your potential. So now we've got the physical, we've got the spiritual, we've got the mental parts of personal development. make it to the end of this video I want you to write this the world is an empty canvas waiting on new thoughts to think and it's on us creative visionaries it's on us to create those thoughts you pop up with the vision and the idea and everybody monkey see monkey do they all fall in line they want to do exactly what you did what is that vision what is that idea that you're sitting on what is that dream that showed up to you and only you you have to have everything you want written. If you do not have it written down, your chances of it happening is reduced drastically because it's a principle of success.